Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for um, joining um, our um, uh, club meeting, I should say, um, uh, Vancouver Coin, Ancient Coin Club meeting uh, via uh, Zoom. Uh, this is the first time we're doing this, and, uh, and I um, am very, very happy that um, we are able to do this, thanks to Julian and um, uh, and, and Paul Anderson, uh, who um, um, provided the uh, financial support um, to do this. And, um, and again, um, as uh, Julian mentioned, this is the um, second present presentation in the series um, uh, of uh, introduction to ancient um, coinage. Um, it comprises um, seven presentations. Um, the first one was um, uh, pre-coinage economies and the development of um, uh, coinage. Now we're talking about um, counterfeiting. And then uh, there will be uh, the archaic period, um, classical period, Hellenistic period, Roman period, and late Roman period in the series. Um, I offered um, this um, course um, to um, uh, the um, continuing education departments at UBC and SFU um, quite a while ago. And um, so uh, finally I said, um, I'm about to forget what I um, taught them. So let's do it uh, one more time and uh, so that I refresh my memory. Um, in this talk, uh, I'm not going to cover um, the whole counterfeiting um, process in um, ancient coinage, but how counterfeiting um, impacted the development of coinage. Um, and just to um, uh, give you a brief um, idea uh, of my um, um, starting point, uh, I think we have uh, 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 an all bears and rewards because of counterfeiters. If it were not them uh, trying to outwit the um, um, coin issuing um, authorities, we wouldn't have um, coins and we wouldn't have um, heads and tails on coins. So this is, this is really um, a fascinating topic and I hope um, you will find it uh, interesting. I just wanted to give you this um, and, and just, you know, um, just to share with you what modern um, banks um, do to, uh, to prevent um, counterfeiting. And this is um, a 2,600 year old, year old um, uh, process. Uh, it is, there was never a gap uh, in this process. Um, the um, uh, coin issuing um, authorities, um, banks, uh, kings, um, emperors um, uh, introduced new um, coins, banknotes, and the counterfeiters simply followed them very, very closely. Uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with ancient coinage, I have this slide, but um, most people here will know what an ancient coinage, what um, ancient coins are. Um, it's a means of exchange, usually round shape, bearing the official sign or badge of a state, individual, or institute that guarantee the weight and pureness of its metal. This is what makes uh, a, a piece of metal a coin. Without um, uh, this, uh, the you know, sign or badge of a state uh, that guarantee the weight and pureness of its metal, it's not a coin. It's maybe a metal maybe money, you can call it um, a money, but it's not a coin. So coins that do not deteriorate much, even though they were buried underground for hundreds of years, play an important role in research and understanding of the ancient world. 
it's it's an amazing um, area of study uh, for anyone who is interested in history. And even those who are not interested in history, uh, many times when I um, um, talk about ancient coins and bring up uh, an interesting um, type uh, to people's attention, I find that they um, they you know. They appreciate it and they, uh, they feel um, fascinated by those stories that we see on coins. And therefore, they are considered the miniature libraries of history, and it's not an exaggeration. So what is money? In uh, the ancient world, money was anything that you can exchange uh, with, with other people. Um, all were called olive oil, uh, liquid gold. Um, it was such um, a valuable commodity uh, at that time. However, every product was not easy to carry along and a commodity at hand would not always match what is needed or offered. So they needed to find um, something to facilitate that. So precious metals, especially gold and silver, were first employed to facilitate commerce. However, it was going to take time to standardize them, to turn them into um, coinage. But how did that happen? Um, we see um, a lot of um, electrum ingots um, in commerce and uh, in museums, of course, and um, in uh, various catalogs. And, um, and from uh, um, comparison, we know that they were intentional um, castings. They were not just um, uh, coincidental um, pieces of metal. And um, they, uh, they came in certain weight standards that tells us that they were intentionally uh, cast um, at to represent a certain value, uh, intrinsic value of that uh, of that metal, and um, from the the texture, uh, we we can simply see that they were cast in clay, uh, which is um, a, a practice uh, or sand, which is a practice that uh, is still employed in in, in the industry. Um, and these are all um, um, open um, surface um, um, castings. So, yeah. Then uh, we come across um, blanks prepared for um, striking. Um, if it is, um, uh, if it is an unstruck plan, uh, the weight is most consistent with um, 24 um, stator, um, as uh, the example here, we know that it is um, a flan intended for um, striking. And um, you see scratches on both sides um, indicating um, circulation. Um, and I asked this question here, defying the blank flan theory. So um, was it in circulation the way it was? We will never know. And, um, but uh, this, these um, scratches simply uh, tell us that it was in circulation for quite a long time. Um, so uh, even though it was not struck um, as a coin, it continued. Uh, to circulate as is, which tells us that the intrinsic value um, was uh, most important uh, in this case, but not um, the, um, uh, the, the strike or, or uh, the symbols that we see uh, as a result of a um, strike. There's always this question um, if uh, these blanks are modern uh, invented um, ingots. Um, there are, of course, tests uh, to um, um, understand um, if they are old or new, but um, they're both costly and sophisticated, and um, most of the time it's not worth um, going through the trouble. The biggest problem here is that most of these um, uh, 
examples are um, out of context. They, um, they were found by whoever and, um, and they are not recorded. Um, and, and interestingly, they're not extremely rare. They are rare, but there are plenty uh, of them out there um, in the market and uh, in, in catalogs, in museums. However, um, uh, con contextual finds are very rare. So we're not in a position to attest to um, um, the, the, the right uh, or intended use of these blanks. And then all of a sudden we see um, lumps with a certain mark um, on one side. Um, this is a, an interesting example. It was just haphazardly um, cast into something, clay most likely, without really um, uh, you know, smoothing or anything. Um, but in a, in a certain way, standards, that's for sure. And, uh, and this one, so is this one, um, but uh, the, um, the clay that they cast the, um, the, the, uh, the metal in was um, smoothed somewhat. Um, and interestingly, um, this one has a single and this one has a double punch mark. Um, and it certainly serves to show the depth of the metal. So there was, what was the reason for that? Uh, for quite a while, they, um, I'm going back, they, they simply used these lumps and um, they didn't have any problem, but all of a sudden something happened and they decided to put a punch mark on the reverse, or on one side, I should say, <clears throat> because we don't know yet if um, they are reverses or what. They are just trying to uh, do something uh, to prevent something, maybe. And that's, that's the beginning of coinage, I say. From this moment on, coinage is um, beginning. And right after that, we start seeing some people doing some nasty things. Uh, again, here are three examples from the um, same period, um, around 650 BC um, or 680 BC, I don't know. Um, people start to play the base metal pellets with electron foil after punching deep into the metal. So um, the authority decided to uh, punch into the metal to show that the metal is um, pure inside out. And the counterfeiters simply um, defied their logic and they um, punched the base metal first and then uh, plated them with um, precious metal. Who were the counterfeiters? That's the, um, that's the question we will keep asking. And then the um, mints decided to um, uh, put patterns. Um, they wanted to design the punch instead of just um, um, a shapeless um, punch, they decided to put some designs. And as soon as they put designs, counterfeiters simply follow them one step behind. And in this case, in the second example here, um, they plated a silver core um, uh, with uh, electron. So the previous one has a bronze core or a copper core. And this is um, uh, one with um, uh, pure metal, uh, but this one uh, was uh, first uh, minted, I will say here, 
uh, with silver and then uh, plate it with um, uh, electron. Uh, certainly there was um, a substantial gain here and um, otherwise they wouldn't go uh, uh, through this uh, trouble because as we will discuss um, later, it was not an easy process. We just say they plated in, um, base metal with uh, precious metal, but it's not that easy. Um, mints continued to uh, find ways to um, distinguish themselves from uh, counterfeiters, and counterfeiters simply followed them uh, one step behind. Uh, here we have um, the um, satriated uh, type, um, different ones, uh, one punch mark, two punch marks, and here um, we have the um, forays. Uh, by the way, foray is a French word for um, plated um, coins. Um, numismatists are interesting people. Um, somebody um, starts using a um, a term and everybody follows. Um, it's a plated coin. And then, of course, um, the uh, the most significant development uh, took place um, when the Lydian uh, kings um, decided to use their own batch, their own royal symbol, um, to um, um, to make their coins. Um, acceptable, um, reputable, um, so that they can um, easily um, circulate. And uh, for the first time, we see um, a set of denominations um, uh, uh, with um, strict rules. The royal batch on the obverse Guaranteed the weight and purity of metal, which makes it for it makes more than just money. First coin, uh, we can um, say. And counterfeiters forced mints to take further measures to prevent forging. The punch marks also served in this case to push the metal into the obverse die to create an impression. So uh, behind the, the force behind the invention of coinage here obviously seems uh, to be the efforts of counterfeiters, no one else. They didn't come up with this idea on their own. The Libyan king didn't came up with this. Maybe they came up with the idea of putting his, um, his symbol on the obverse, but there was um, something behind that that forced them to um, come up with this idea. And it was the forgers. Um, coin making techniques um, are um, experimented and um, well known right now, but um, it was um, it was something that everyone discovered um, in, uh, in the ancient world. Um, you have um, two dies, obverse and reverse dies, and um, you put the obverse die, you place it in, in an anvil, and um, you prepare your uh, flan, the blank, and um, uh, attach the uh, reverse die to um, a punch, and then you strike. And uh, here is an interesting uh, coin from the um, uh, Roman Republic. Uh, showing the um, coin minting um, uh, gear, uh, and, and you know that really tells you that this is a process that was um, well known. How well known? It's a different issue. Now I have a video here to share with you. Um, let's watch this. Uh, we we tested this with Julian, and um, he was unable to hear the uh, the narrative but um, there is a text that follows. So I hope um, you will be able to um, understand what they're talking about. Oh. 
Okay, so um, the process uh, looks quite straightforward, but um, there are so many um, variables here that um, we have to appreciate uh, those variables. So I wanted to um, share with you uh, the, the process, how it must have been um, in the past. And and I um, researched um, quite a bit and, and found um, many um, articles, uh, researchers done on, um, uh, on these ancient um, counterfeits. Um, one is really particularly interesting by Susan Lemis, um, I guess it is the name of the article is silver plating on copper, bronze and brass. Um, and, and she um, provides um, some cross sections uh, uh, of um, um, the coin that she studied. Unfortunately, she doesn't mention um, the, uh, the you know, type of coin that she studied. She just provides these um, um, scans. Uh, and um, she says copper, and silver, and in the middle, she finds um, some substance, and she calls it a solder. Um, so I, I I really don't know uh, when and why they um, might have used um, soldering and how it was um, employed in this case. But this is really interesting. I was unable to read the whole um, article but I read another article that mentions this article and, and the author of the other article um, also complains that um, she doesn't provide much information about the, um, the type of the coin and the age and, and, and everything. But it is, it is interesting to see um, that, you know, they, um, they use different techniques um, to um, plate um, coins. And, and, you know, uh, it was not uh, an easy process. That's to say the least, it, a lot of things must have um, involved, must have been involved in this process. 
So mining mineral ore or obtaining metal first, building a furnace to smelt ores with um, coal to reach a certain degree of heat, um, weighing smelted metal and cast blanks, um, you have to do a good job uh, in um, weighing because, you know, weighing is uh, the most crucial thing here because you need to uh, match uh, the well-known standard weight, uh, which was not so difficult apparently. Uh, weighing systems um, uh, were created or um, invented uh, long before that time. Uh, this is really interesting. Um, a, a lady tied orthostat um, showing um, probably a merchant uh, holding a small um, um, scale, uh, obviously, to uh, weigh uh, small items like precious metals. Um, then, of course, uh, you need to build molds with indentations to cast blanks in certain size and weight, um, engrave overs and reverse dies. Strike coins to be counterfeited in base metal, plate them with precious metals, and pass them uh, into circulation. It's not a small, um, small job. It's it's a very very sophisticated process. Even though it looks quite doable, um, so. Um, I've always suspected that um, counterfeiters were not um, ordinary people. And um, if not the uh, mint workers themselves. Yet counterfeiters continue to follow official mints one step behind, I say. So um, the Lydian um, kings uh, decided to use their symbol on the coins and the counterfeiters simply followed them. And I say, did they operate in the same workshop? We will never know other than the fact that we can um, sometimes see dye matches. When we see dye matches, which is not so difficult uh, if we can bring the material together, uh, the biggest challenge here is um, that um, we either don't have the same material in the same location, uh, at the same location, uh, say um, most of these studies uh, are conducted in, in museums um, and, and you don't always have the, um, the pure metal uh, examples and uh, the um, counterfeited um, material and, and you can only do so much uh, based on uh, the information that you find online. Uh, however, um, I have some examples here to share with you that you know, will intrigue you. So uh, here, um, Lydian uh, uh, examples, uh, simply uh, plated uh, base uh, bronze, base uh, plated with uh, uh, Of course, you had contemporary imitations, and we should not really confuse them with uh, the counterfeit coins that we are talking about. They're imitations. And as long as um, uh, their um, metal pureness is fine, people didn't have any problem. As you see, they survived, um, they circulated, and um, people didn't have any problem with them. And then, of course, you have these extremely interesting um, um, inscribed uh, coins, sometimes, um, attributed to certain uh, Libyan kings. I certainly don't agree with these Alietes um, um, attribution. Uh, there is nothing to um, really um, indicate that this, whatever they are trying to read here, while wet, um, uh, it, it does, it, it has nothing to do with um, Alietes, but uh, this is one problem um, um, uh, that commercial numismatists um, have um, to make their uh, merchandise more valuable or more interesting. They sometimes 
uh, invent things, uh, but that's another topic. Um, to uh, uh, validate um, a, a good coin, um, they also use uh, bankers' marks or marks that we, you know, numismatists um, say they are bankers' marks. Sometimes you have one, sometimes you have several, and as in uh, this example, you have 14 bankers' um, marks. This is, um, uh, it's not a game, maybe um, uh, each banker or each merchant uh, simply uh, put their mark to, um, um, before passing it into the next person, uh, just to, you know, uh, let everyone know that it was tested each time uh, it, it circulated. Um, and, and they thought that would solve the problem, but counterfeiters were just following them very closely. Here is um, another example with um, a silver core this time, uh, numerous counter marks um, along the um, edges. And it is plated with um, electron. Um, those who are interested in ancient coinage and um, the uh, uh, the early um, ancient coinage will recognize these um, uh, finest um, uh, series. Um, they um, are um, one of the earliest inscribed. Um, coins uh, together with the Libyan um, inscribed coins. Um, and, and this one um, um, being different from uh, the Libyan examples uh, bears um, a Greek uh, inscription which can be read easily and um, it says uh, I am the um, sign or badge of uh, finance and counterfeiters were following them too. So um, whenever possible, whatever coin um, found its way into the um, market and again uh, reputation as, um, as a pure coin, counterfeiters simply followed them. Um, here is an interesting example. Um, I um, found this coin, uh, the one on the top, um, early um, during my uh, research. And, and I said, wow, what a fascinating coin. And then I um, started to uh, uh, research for uh, the, um, the plated coins and I um, found this one. You know, come on, it cannot be um, a simple counterfeiter following these people. Uh, they were in the same mint. It's absolutely mint work. It's not an individual um, crook uh, following and doing this. They were producing uh, pure coins alongside, they were producing um, counterfeits. And and everyone simply was following each other's uh, path. Each mint was following uh, the other uh, mint. And they, here is um, an Malaysian um, uh, example. Here is an uncertain um, uh, small coin. And here I have um, an interesting uh, example. And it, to me, it looks almost um, the same uh, die. So, um, of course, the photographs are not always um, good when you find them online, and it's not really possible to um, uh, to attest to uh, the theory. But um, this simply tells me that. Uh, the so-called official mints were also producing uh, counterfeit coins. And why wouldn't they, um, you know, if they can, of course, uh, survive, if they can 
pass the uh, forgeries uh, into circulation. Um, here uh, is a um, uh, swastika uh, like, uh, or sometimes uh, they are called windmill um, uh, pattern um, uh, overs uh, with a very similar uh, reverse. And here is the counterfeit um, example of the same coin. Uh, you name it. Uh, any pattern that you come across um, by any mint uh, was counterfeited by whoever. Here is another example with a uh, facing head of a line overs and a punch um, reverse. And um, here is one from Midland. Uh, Lesbos. Um, it's, it's a fascinating um, coin, and um, they uh, they uh, came up with a fascinating uh, reverse uh, idea. Instead of um, a simple punch mark, they um, simply um, uh, put the Incus hat of um, Calf. Uh, it's 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 a fascinating idea and artistically um, beautiful rendition here, and they plated the same coin um, later. And uh, then, of course, uh, Croesus um, initiated um, gold and silver for the first time um, as coin metals. And it was a, a revolutionary um, step in the um, spread of um, coins uh, into metals for the first time. And um, hence, um, counter um, the crooks simply followed uh, Croesus too. And silver coins, they were simply counterfeited at the same time alongside the um, gold ones. And now going back, um, here are um, two blanks. Um, one um, intended to um, be used as a standardized um, piece of metal. Uh, and this tells us that they were um, counterfeited. I was not able to find um, um, an example um, without any um, obverse reverse um, patterns um, counterfeited. But this example uh, tells me that um, crooks were following from the beginning. Or the mints, whoever uh, issuing these pieces, were simply um, doing the same thing. And here is um, a prepared uh, flan. Uh, and it's also, um, it has a, a chisel mark and um, they wanted to see if it is um, real or not. Uh, there are apparently um, some inscriptions um, regarding the test cuts. This is uh, the longest and the most interesting one. And um, it's from uh, 375, 74 BC. Uh, the, um, uh, the Athenians simply um, appointed a dokimastes or a tester to sit near the banking tables in the Agora. And um, they were simply um, chiseling um, coins uh, for merchants, for people. And, um, and um, if they are uh, good, pure metal um, coins, they let them circulate. As you see, this one has one, two, three, four, five um, chisel marks, and it continued to circulate. And um, if it is um, a bad coin, um, they would simply um, uh, destroy it, and um, they would um, uh, take it off from the market. And um, they say that um, the withdrawn um, coins uh, were dedicated to the mother of the gods. 
Um, but I, I, I don't know about that. There is, um, unfortunately, um, there is not much evidence about that. However, um, test cuts didn't start in 375. Uh, here are some archaic um, Athenian all examples um, uh, with um, test cuts. Uh, so uh, test cuts um, were there from the beginning, and it's just that it was legislated by the Athenian uh, authorities uh, and inscribed uh, on uh, stone in 375-74 BC. Um, since um, I'm interested in uh, these ancient um, counterfeits, I um, tried to collect them. Uh, these uh, three examples are in my collection. And um, I, I published this in my uh, SNG. I think it's a legitimate um, item to publish um, so that people um, have an idea uh, about these coins. And uh, this one uh, is also in my uh, collection, but this one I found online. But there are many, many of them uh, available online. Um, you can find many uh, of these. So they were detected, they were destroyed, but what happened? Why did they continue to survive? Um, we don't know but they survived. People simply didn't uh, try to strip off the, um, the, the remaining silver. Um, it was not worth it, or they didn't have uh, the time or the chance to do it. So this is a silicate coin. This is um, a fifth century BC um, uh, Tarsus stator. This is an Alexander uh, Tetradrama. And uh, why did these uh, survive? Um, we don't know, but they did. And quite many of them survived. So you have test cuts and um, counterfeiters simply um, um, struck the coin and put the test mark on it and then plated them. And this practice continued all through the time. And this one is uh, really interesting. Uh, this one, or both of them have uh, multiple test cuts. And this one, they did a um, shallow test cut here and a very, very deep test cut here. Yet, you can see in time, uh, the uh, silver uh, uh, wore off and you can see the um, bronze core underneath. There are um, discussions about how um, these plated coins were um, produced. And um, some people uh, believe that um, they plated um, a base metal core with a precious metal and then struck, which I don't agree. I believe they struck the, uh, the base metal um, coin first, and then they plated them. Uh, I have, um, these are two um, coins that I, um, uh, I have uh, in my collection. Um, you don't have these coins in bronze. So they were obviously um, intended for plating. And, um, and it would be difficult to uh, play an unstruck uh, piece of metal uh, because um, you use a five kilo uh, sledgehammer and the impact would simply destroy that thin layer of silver or gold or whatever the, the plating uh, precious metal is. So it was out, out, um, absolutely not um, striking after plating, but uh, striking, striking the coin in bronze and then plating it. And some of those simply survived. And um, 
and they continue um, uh, circulating from uh, one collector to another. However, um, there are certain uh, things that we can uh, see that will um, give out the um, uh, the counterfeit other than the weight, of course. Um, this is an, an Athenian uh, tetradrachma, and they're supposed to be around 17.2 grams, 17.25, 17.50, 60, and sometimes towards the end of the 5th century, 420s, 412, they go under uh, 17 and they are 16.5, 16.7, but never under 16.5 uh, when uh, uh, it was struck with pure silver. Uh, and these are usually in the range of the counterfeits or the uh, plated coins are in the range of um, 14.5 uh, to uh, 15.5 grams. So uh, on each coin, um, they, they make um, around 60 to 70% profit. It's, it's a lot of money uh, in ancient times. And this one is also uh, in, in my um, collection. So it's, it's obvious these coins were never minted in, um, uh, in bronze. Uh, so bronze prepared um, to be plated with silver. And here, oh, I wanted to talk about this air bubble here. This air bubble simply tells us that this is um, a plated coin and, um, and it's, it's underweight. No mint, no city-state, no kingdom, no empire was immune to counterfeiting. Just like uh, the um, COVID-19. It doesn't care where you live and um, what your nationality is. It finds you and um, all the mints, they are, uh, they suffered from the same thing, gold, silver, and um, other material, and you find them everywhere. So uh, from the beginning, it is there. Uh, and no matter what, no matter how reputable your mint is, you get um, counterfeits or silver-plated coins. And that's why I theorize that most of these coins uh, the counterfeit coins uh, were actually produced in the same mint or in the nearby mint, if not the same mint. But this is a, a sophisticated process. This cannot be done uh, by simple um, um, counterfeiters. Um, you have to. Um, you have to know how to make your molds. You have to know um, how to um, plate them, and then, of course, circulating them uh, or passing them into circulation is another issue. Uh, here is um, Alexander III flip three type uh, with bronze core, and um, here is a Roman Republican uh, piece, a uh, very well known piece. And um, maybe one of the most famous uh, ones would be an 8R denarius. Um, it was also, uh, they are rare, they are extremely rare, and um, they sold for uh, ridiculous prices, but um, counterfeiters simply um, didn't miss the chance. And, um, and then, of course, you have um, Roman. Um, gold coins being counterfeited all along. This one is really interesting, and, and um, I found this uh, during my uh, research several years ago. Um, the forger first attempted to make a silver um, plated um, coin. Um, 
wanted to forge an Argentus. Um, and then either the same forger or another individual gold plated the coin in an attempt to pass it off as an um, RLS. Um, Maximianus first reign. Um, here is the, um, the coin in, in, in silver, um, and here is the coin uh, in um, gold. And if you look at here on the reverse, you can see the, uh, the silvering underneath. However, if you look at here, you can see the bronze core. I mean, these people were really um, talented. <laughs> Even this rabbit edge um, failed to prevent counterfeit. Um, I don't believe these were just simple, um, um, you know, interesting designs. Um, but at the same time, um, they were simply counterfeited. And how about the brokerages? Um, everybody knows that brokerages are, um, you know, interesting, and they are um, uh, mint mistakes, right? Uh, the um, uh, the minted coin sticks to the um, punch, and um, you have um, the incus of the um, obers on the reverse. So they're interesting, um, and. Um, we, we, you know, many collectors, many um, researchers um, enjoy studying them, uh, but even they were um, counterfeited. I found this one uh, most interesting. This is the um, the last uh, slide that I will share with you. Um, uh, it's um, Julius Caesar um, Denarius um, from uh, late 46, early 45 BC. Um, um, it's, it's like a contemporary um, imitation, um, uh, but look what they did. They simply used uh, an obverse that you see uh, on um, a, a different uh, denarius uh, by the monier uh, Plautius Blancus. This is a very well-known uh, coin, and the inscription here, um, I don't know if it is, if it was deliberately uh, um, shallow it off or um, uh, it wore out, it, it certainly passed in the circulation, so it survived, but uh, they simply uh, created um, a mule. So it's, it's, it's amazing how um, they were able to, um, how much thought went into um, counterfeiting. And um, this issue is going to um, continue uh, to fascinate um, many people in, uh, in the coming years and decades and centuries, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I have here some uh, references for further reading. Some of them are um, really um, um, uh, formative, especially um, uh, Wayne Salis's Classical Deceptions, Counterfeits, Forgeries, and Reproductions of Ancient Coins um, is a, a good read. Uh, the others, are um, interesting uh, if you want to um, um, research deeper into uh, um, um, the uh, science of ancient numismatics. Um, but it's a fascinating topic to, um, uh, to research on. Thank you very much um, Welcome, for your Thank time. You. Yeah, and, and I can take um, your questions now if you like. Thank you, Becker Ken. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Very interesting. Thank you very much.